I would say at Harvard, I began to fill in more of the kind of the historical foundation for what's now known as modern American conservatism, in some ways known as classical liberalism. The principles are timeless and eternal. Um, I mean, to be a conservative today to means to be a champion of individual freedom and the human spirit. How that, those principles play out in policies can change, though, because circumstances change. Why are you a conservative at the end of the day? I'm a conservative because I do believe in the freedom and dignity of the individual. It's not just a philosophical basis, it's a biblical basis. And I, I think, as one of my professors once said, these ideas work because they are true. They're not true because they work. This is Intelligence Matters with Michael Morrell, a joint production of the Cypherbrief.com and CBS News. I'm Cypher Brief CEO and publisher Suzanne Kelly. In this podcast, the former acting director of the CIA speaks with top leaders asking the right questions and making connections that provide deeper insight into complex security events. Because intelligence matters. Tom Cotton is a United States Senator from Arkansas. He is a Republican, he is a prominent conservative voice in our nation, and he is a leader on national security issues in the Senate. He is the only member of his party to serve on both the Intelligence and Armed Services Committees. Senator Cotton is a veteran of the United States Army, serving in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He is the youngest member of the Senate, and he is frequently mentioned as a future presidential candidate. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with the Senator to talk about his career and his views on national security. This is Intelligence Matters, and I'm Michael Morrell. Senator, thank you for being with us. It's a real honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. A big chunk of our listeners, Senator, are young people in college, young professionals who are thinking about the life ahead of them and the career choices that they face. And one of the things they really like to hear in these discussions are the career choices and backgrounds of the people that I talk to. So I'd love to start there. They want to hear what I did so they don't wind up like a politician. No, exactly. <laughs> they want to figure out how they end up as a United States senator. That's what they want to figure out. So you grew up in Arkansas on a cattle ranch. What was that like? It was a great upbringing. It, you know, cattle ranch I found in my time for people who didn't grow up in Arkansas. Sounds a little grandiose. You know, they think it's a 100,000 acre spread in North Texas. You know, it's very small. Most, most people who grow up on uh, cattle ranches around the country, grew up on very small plots of land, had very small heads of cattle, like we do. You know, it was the second job for my father, full-time job for me when I was a kid. Um, but it was a very good upbringing. You know, taught me a lot of important lessons about taking responsibility So you and worked discipline. on the farm? Oh, yeah. From the time I was probably about five years old, my mother had been my father's farmhand until then, and I think she decided that it was time for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably wasn't big enough to start at that age, but, uh, yeah, from the time I was about five, I was my dad's main farmhand. And what was, what was the conversation like around the family dinner table when you were growing up? Not political or policy-based at all. Um, my parents were conservative in kind of a traditional and moral sense, but they were not politically active. You know, in, in Arkansas in those days, really until just about eight years ago, it was a one-party democratic state. So the democratic primary is all that mattered. You know, my parents didn't put up yard signs or bumper stickers or anything because they didn't want to offend the other guy's supporters because most politics in a one-party state is, is more based on like personality and geography and so forth, not, not ideas. So we talked more about the farm. You know, my parents talked about their work. My sister and I, with my parents, talked about school and our sporting or other extracurricular activities. What did your parents do? So my father was an employee at the State Department of Health. He had started out after he got back from Vietnam uh, and got an advanced degree in poultry science with a company that later got rolled up in Tyson's gradual growth in the industry. And that was as a young man, probably mid-20s. They wanted him as part of their junior uh, leader development program to move, I think, to Alabama, far, far away from our little hometown. And uh, he left that job because he didn't want to move. Um, he had a father who was growing ill and an uh, aunt to whom he was very close who had been widowed recently and that uncle he was very close to. So he decided to leave that job and go to work for the Department of Health because uh, it meant that although you know wouldn't pay, pay as much, wouldn't have as much career prospects in terms of income, career progression outside of Dardanelle, it would allow him to have a stable life there, to run the family farms and care for his aunt and 
care for his father and his mother. Uh, my mother, meanwhile, had gotten her degree while my father was in Vietnam, and then they got married and moved back to his hometown. She became a teacher. She spent the first probably 15 years of her life teaching high school, career, training, and home economics uh, at night. And on the summer, she got a master's in education that allowed her to become an administrator. So she spent about the last 25 years of her career as a middle school assistant principal and then principal. I'll throw an editorial comment in here. I think teaching is the most important profession in America. It's a critical role. It's not so much fun when your mom is your principal in middle school, <laughs> but once you're past middle school and you don't care what seventh and eighth graders think and you need someone to go home and get the sneakers that you left before basketball practice, it's pretty handy. So what did, what did growing up in rural Arkansas in this conservative family, how did that shape you? What did you, what, what well, did you take away from I, that? So that? I think there's no doubt that it helped you know, prepare the ground, so to speak, for what became a politically conservative worldview, which probably started the second half of high school for me, um, really after Bill Clinton, you know, ran for president and became president. You know, that's when I was 15 or 16 and began to get more interested in, in politics, reading the front page, not just the sport pages of the newspapers. Also, the first time I started having real history classes in high school, and I always en- enjoyed those as well, um, taught me a lot, like I said, a lot of practical life lessons, um, you know, kept me connected to the you know, earthy realities of life as opposed to abstractions. Um, you know, just to give you one example of, you know, from just last week, you know, last week as Washington was consumed with the fire and fury about fire and fury, uh, it was also gripped like the rest of the nation, bitter cold. Uh, well, in Arkansas, most people I know who had cattle were gripped with how they were going to break the ice in the ponds to make sure the cattle had water to drink and if a calf was born, how they were going to keep the calf alive in you know, single-digit temperatures. Things like that keep you very grounded in the practical realities of the world as opposed to you know, the abstractions that the oftentimes we, dominate in Washington or social media. Right. The things we talk about here in Washington aren't so real sometimes. And they, but it also, I mean, the things we talk about are very real, and you, know, you have this experience. You know, at the CIA, I mean, sometimes you're dealing in abstractions, things that are, you know, a foreign leader's intentions and plans are, but many of them are very practical, concrete things as well. You know, what a, what a missile program's progress looks like or how far it can reach or how fast it can be fueled or so forth. And those are very real things that a lot of people in Washington don't always appreciate. So your dad served in Vietnam? He did. For how long and, and where? And So he, uh, he volunteered in 1968 to enlist in the Army. So the, the draft was still on then, but he wasn't drafted. He had graduated from college in 67. That was at a time when you could still take one deferment into another kind of deferment. So like any student, he had a college deferment. He became a teacher and got a teacher's deferment. After about six months, he decided, while it might be the most important profession in the world, it wasn't for him. So he volunteered for the Army and ended up as an infantryman, 4th Infantry Division in Vietnam. So you know he was out in the jungles, walking point. But he only did that for two years. You know, back in those days, an enlistment contract, like a draft contract, was a two-year contract. So you basically spent a year in the United States, you know, doing your training and preparing, spent 365 days in Vietnam, and then you spent whatever time left you had in the States. He actually ended up doing a little bit less than that. Once you got done with your 365 in Vietnam, the Army would often cut you loose. So you ended up spending about 21 or 22 months left. So he was was there in 1969? He would have been there in the summer of 69 to the summer of 70. That's a tough year. Not an easy year now, that's for sure. And I heard you tell David Axelrod in his podcast, which, by the way, is terrific, and I recommend that people go listen to it, that you talked to your dad about his experience. We did. Uh, It was frequently my father talking to me uh, on the farm, which is both the main place we had our conversation since we spent much time there and the main way we had our conversations with my father in send mode and me in receive mode. I wouldn't say it was a, a systematic conversation, more in snippets, oftentimes in vignettes of how, you know, we might be in the in the wood line because a fence is, had broken and we had to repair the fence so the cattle wouldn't get onto the neighbor's land. And it might be rainy uh, or recently have rained and helicopters from the local National Guard unit would fly over. And he'd say things like, you know, this reminds me of being in Vietnam, you know, being in the woods when it's rainy and humid and having helicopters fly over. Were there teaching points attached to his little anecdotes? You know, again, the kind of the practical realities of the world, you know, was always close at hand. And then to abstract up a higher level, um, just, you know, discipline and focus and methodical planning, the kind of things you learn in the Army. You know, my 
father, when he goes to deer camp, still takes all of his equipment and lays it out in a dress right dress fashion in the living room floor to my mother's chagrin. And, you know, that didn't come from nowhere. That came from the training that we all received in the Army to prepare for inspections and basic training. So that kind of kind of systematic, methodical, disciplined approach to any task, no matter how small or big, uh, that my father had, you know, I probably got passed on to me as well. So how did he think about his service? And in particular, how did he think about how Americans treated he was very Vietnam He was very proud of his returned. service. He was very uh, disappointed in the way his fellow citizens treated Vietnam veterans. He, he didn't personally face much of that. You know, he landed, I believe, back in Fort Lewis, Washington, coming back from Vietnam. And, you know, they basically gave him a steak dinner at the dining facility and slapped him on the back and plane ticket home to Little Rock. Um, I don't think he faced, you know, real protesters or any kind of situation that you sometimes see depicted in the movies, but he obviously saw that on TV and he thought that was disgraceful. That, you know, even if you opposed a war, you shouldn't oppose the people who are fighting it, especially the people who were fighting it through no choice of their own, who had been drafted. Um, he was very busy after he got back from Vietnam, first you know, got married, was taking care of three farms that were in pretty bad shape at the time, taking care of my aunt and his father and mother. You know, he, he worked with veterans, helped veterans get the equivalent of what we would today call a GED. So basically I had three jobs at a time, then he started a family. Um, but in the 1980s, he started getting a little bit more active in uh, Vietnam veterans' efforts. So he worked to help get a, a miniature of the Vietnam veteran memorial wall at our state capitol. And my uh, joining the Army, uh, which preceded by a couple of years his retirement from his job, actually I think was a good catalyst for him to get a lot more active in veterans' causes in retirement. So he's chair of the Arkansas State Veterans Commission, appointed by a Democrat. And uh, he's also the chair of the American Legion Boys State Program. That's true. Those, those keep him busy as well. Um, so he's very active working with veterans. Did he ever make it back to Vietnam? He has not made it back, no. I would love to be able to go back sometime and have him go with me. Now, for, for him, you know, going to Little Rock to visit my sister and uh, her son is a pretty big trip. <laughs> to say nothing of coming to Washington for uh, my swearing in. Yeah. So getting him on a flight that's going to yeah. go across the Pacific might be a big lift. But, you know, we did have an occasion a couple of years ago in northwest Arkansas when uh, Walmart had an event where they were opening a local trade office for a Vietnamese company, you know, one of their state-owned or state-affiliated enterprises. So they had several officials from the Vietnam government, that enterprise there. And my father came to that. And I was able to speak there, and it was a special time for me. Yeah. Uh, it's probably yeah. the first first time in 45 years that he had been able to meet representatives of the Vietnamese government and shake their hands, and I think it was a special time for him as well. Yeah, I've heard Senator McCain speak eloquently about the impact that, that returning to Vietnam has on the people who serve there. Yeah, and like I said, I, I would like to be able to go back with him. I just don't know if we can yeah. get him to yeah. take that long yeah. flight. But like, like a lot of Vietnam veterans, it's something that you know he's— particularly connected to, and, and he voted for a long time, basically, on the grounds of a veteran service or Vietnam veteran service. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, probably the first presidential election I remember in any, any detail would have been 1988, and he voted um, for Al Gore because Al Gore had served mm. in Vietnam. Mm. So then you go to public high school in Dardanelle. Mm -hmm. Sand lizards is a... Is quite Unique mascot. The only, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, quite the I think mascot. it's the only one in the nation, yeah. And what, uh, what kind of things were you interested in? I know you were in junior ROTC. Um, can talk about that yeah, a little bit. I was, uh, I was mostly interested in sports. <laughs> I played baseball as a, as a little boy, and then I played basketball once I realized I was going to be taller than most kids by the time I was in middle school and then in high school as well. Uh, we did have a very good junior ROTC program led by two good men, veterans themselves, Lieutenant Colonel. And why did you join John them? Uh, it was a very common, very popular program. So it was probably the single biggest extracurricular activity we had in the school. And, uh, really but no, no sense at that point that you wanted to join the I, Army someday? No, I, I, I had thought about it at, at different times. But uh, it was just, like I said, it was very common, boy and girl alike. You know, most athletes did it. Frankly, it was a recruiting <laughs> tool for some <laughs> athletes <laughs> because you could, you could come from the smaller, less competitive high schools across the county uh, if there was a program that, that a public school had that your school lacked. And RT, we were the only RTC yeah. program in the county. So we got, we got a few good athletes from uh -huh. uh, Ola and Plainview and, and Kesa. Um, and in terms of academics, I would say that, uh, you know, the main motivating factor to be a good student was so I'd be eligible for sports and not have my curfew shortened by my parents. Again, I was a, I guess I was a sophomore when Bill Clinton was running for president. 
and, and maybe that's just the time that's also in Arkansas. In those days, the day you take your first world history class, uh, maybe it was a combination of those factors. But I, I stopped reading the sports pages solely and started reading the front news pages. And, and then the next year had American history, and the year after that had European history and always enjoyed those classes and just started you know, following the news and following politics a lot more. So what kind of things did you do in junior ROTC? In junior RTC, you know, we you know, did drill and ceremony, did military history, you did some basic marksmanship, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I had a big inspection every year from the RTC regional headquarters that you geared up for. And what did you learn from it? Reinforced some of the lessons that you know, I'd learned on the farm from my mom and dad, uh, that I learned from you know, sports from my coach as well, about you know, being disciplined and focused and methodical, taking responsibility for oneself, you know, teamwork, you know, being surrounded by a team, same thing you learn in sports. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you have respect for the the two guys who ran the program. Oh, very much so. Yeah, and one of them was my homeroom advisor. You know, and like most high schools, you know, you had a ten or fifteen minute period where you break off and don't have academic instruction, but just have you know advice or you know chance to do homework. And Sergeant Strawn was one of my advisors. So then you um, then you go off to Harvard. So you must have done very well in high school. <laughs> well enough, I guess. <laughs> you know, I th- you know, my, my sister at the time was at University of Arkansas, and that's where my parents had met. I'd long assumed I'd probably go there. I started probably early in my junior year getting some interest from schools for athletics, for basketball, not University of North Carolina or, or University of Kentucky, by the way, you know, Division II, Division Three schools. And then I started later that year getting interest, academic interest from schools as well. And uh, I thought you know, some of the Ivy League programs might be a good way to combine those two things since they don't offer scholarships. You know, So I got into Harvard and had sent my, my basketball tape in, and uh, assistant coach said, you know, we got your tape, you know, think you can contribute to the program. We don't have scholarships. We just have open tryouts, so we want you to come for those. So I did. And I realized very quickly that while they might not have scholarships, they definitely recruit. And I, I was not recruited. <laughs> so uh, I played one year on the junior varsity That's team. fantastic. I was a yeah. high school hero and college zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you have a sense of what you wanted to be as not in life as you headed off to college? Not really, no. Like I said, I, I was eager for the challenge. Once I confronted the challenge, I realized how challenging it might be. I mean, it was a big transition going from Dardanelle High School to Harvard in an academic sense. Mm-hmm. But it was an you know, exciting time for me as well to you know, leave the farm and see a much bigger, wider part of the world, meet people from not just all around the country, but all around the world. And uh, you know, my, my interest you know, grew and developed. What did you major in? Harvard. I majored in political science. I did mostly political philosophy, though. That was kind of a shift over my first year there. So, you know, I took some of the basic courses you have to take if you're a political science major in terms of like American politics, uh, but also took political philosophy courses and realized pretty quickly that I was more interested in that kind of uh, track other than just your basic like, quantitative approach to American politics, which dominates political science department. So I ultimately did more of kind of a great books track. Um, so within political science, reading, you know, the great books of political philosophy, starting with Plato's Republic and going on down to Nietzsche and Heidegger, as well as American political thought, you know, the thoughts surrounding our founding and Tocqueville and Lincoln and the Civil War and so forth. I tried to minimize the, you know, kind of traditional modern political science mm-hmm. I did. So you came to Harvard with this, with these conservative roots based on where you grew up and your parents and, and all of that. Did you develop an intellectual framework for your conservative oh, views oh, there? So by the time I got to Harvard, I recognized that I was unusual in Arkansas, that I was a Republican. Bill Clinton's first year in office helped contribute to, to that. <laughs> but uh, again, I, I said I hadn't grown up in a political or a partisan household. It's not like, you know, now being a Republican politician and going to Republican events, you realize that, you know, there, there are people out there who are lifelong partisan Republicans. They're raised that way. You know, they have a thousand elephant scarves and pins and decorations in their house in the same way there are Democrats as well. Um, not having grown up like that, though, I wasn't as reflexively partisan as, as some people are, if they grow up in that world, if they're you know out knocking on doors for candidates from the time they're five years old with their mom and dad, but I was a you know pretty conservative, and at, I would say at, at Harvard I began to fill in more of the kind of the historical foundation for what's now known as modern American conservatism, in some ways known as classical liberalism. You know the thought of our founding fathers and Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill and so forth. And also realize that the debates that, that we have today between our two parties are not all that different from the debates that not only that they had around the time of the Civil War or the time of the founding, but 
going back throughout human history, that the same, the same fundamental tensions, debates, or ideas have always been present. That's because, you know, human beings haven't changed. You, know, you and I are no different from two people sitting around, you know, a campfire in ancient Greece or ancient Persia, you know, 3,000 years ago, or the people that we read about in the Bible. So what does it mean in your mind, Senator, to be a conservative today? You know, what does that mean in a practical sense? So the, the principles are timeless and eternal. Um, I mean, to be a conservative today to means to be a champion of individual freedom and the human spirit. How that, those principles play out in policies can change, though, because circumstances change. So, for instance, when Ronald Reagan took office in 1980, he ran on and championed a major cut in the top marginal tax rate. The top marginal tax rate is 70%. <laughs> it's, a, it's a significant inhibition to, you to know, work, to work, <laughs> to work. And, and, and to the rewards of work that is part of the blessings of freedom. When the top marginal tax rate is 39.6, I think that's too high, but it's not nearly like it was in 1980. Likewise, you know, when inflation is running at double digit percent, that's a real problem that impacts concretely, you know, working class blue collar or Kansans, whether it's the price of food they pay or um, the loss of value of the savings they have. When inflation is running at 2% or below, it's just a different set of problems. Today, we face a lot of problems in terms of paying for child care, paying for health care, trying to make ends meet, you know, if, you're, if you don't have a college degree, if you don't have an advanced degree. So while the, while the principles of modern American conservatism may be no different than they were enunciated by someone like Ronald Reagan, the circumstances have changed pretty significantly. And I think Ronald Reagan would have said that as well if he were alive today or could visit some of my conservative friends, he would tell them that they should really try to update their, their policy-based thinking in the same way that, that he faced a different set of problems in 1980 than he, um, was faced by, say, Dwight Eisenhower in 1952 when he got elected president. So why, why are you a conservative at the end of the day? Ultimately, I think you know, I, I'm a conservative because I do believe in the freedom and dignity of the individual. And it's not just a philosophical basis. It's a biblical basis. And I, I think, as one of my professors once said, uh, that these ideas work because they are true. They're not true because they work. And those ideas that, all, that come from the wellspring of individual freedom and dignity about the effectiveness of market-based economics and the centrality of not just the individual, but what Burke called the little platoons, families and neighborhoods and churches, civic organizations, about taking seriously threats to those things, whether those threats come from our streets in the form of crime or come from overseas, from you know, rival nation states or terrorist organizations or so forth. Mm -hmm. So I grew, up, um, I grew up as an economist, and you know, from that perspective, there's absolutely no doubt that one of the greatest gifts to the world and one of the most powerful positive impacts is capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and all of it's done for, uh, for all of us. Yeah, you just, I mean, you just can't look at anywhere around the world and not realize, you know, that market-based economics works. can't be, you know, completely unregulated. You need to have basic rules that ensure that human beings aren't taking advantage of each other, that the powerful aren't exporting the weak, the rich are not exporting the poor. But if you just look at the evidence, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, I have a, a picture on my wall here in my office of the Korean Peninsula from space. Um, and... Some of your listeners may have seen that picture. Um, there's a little yes. tiny dot at Pyongyang, and South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree, and that is the difference visually expressed between slavery and freedom. Or if you look at the progress of nations that, you know, coming out of World War II or coming out of, uh, or getting their independence from colonial status in the 1950s and 1960s and compare ones that took the path of market-based economics and democratization, like, say, Taiwan or South Korea, South Korea to ones who didn't, you know, they had the same population and the same uh, GDP in 1960 as countries who took the other path. And now they're prosperous modern democracies versus countries that are still largely basket cases. So then you go to law school, uh, Harvard Law School. Um, I, took a, I took a year off. So um, I had applied to law school. Uh, my sister by that point was in law school at University of Arkansas. And I always enjoyed you know, listening to her talk about her uh, school and her friends talk. But probably by my senior year, even though I had applied in the fall, I was beginning to have doubts in the spring about whether or not it was the right thing for me to do yet. So I decided to hit pause, and I spent a year and in Claremont, California, and did Claremont Graduate School. I'd been a, a fellow at a summer program they had for two weeks. I got to know some of the folks there. Charles Kessler, who's still a professor there, Larry Yarn, who's now president of Hillsdale College, and because uh, I wanted to explore the possibility of being being a professor, of getting a PhD in uh, 
most likely political science, maybe in philosophy or history, and going on to teach. And after a year of doing that, while I enjoyed it and I continued to learn a lot, I realized that it was probably too kind of isolated and sedentary a life for me. So at that point, I decided to go back to go back to law school. And why law school and not something else? I mean, why law school Good and not... Good question, yeah, retrospect. Yeah, yeah, I often yeah. ask young people yeah. who are going to law school <laughs> that. You know, the classic answer that it's, you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It helps sharpen your mind. You can be a lawyer. You can be a prosecutor or a judge. As I was thinking in law school about public services, the extent that I was thinking... Does it help you when you think about national security issues? It helps to the extent that it was, it was very good in mental training about sorting through evidence, weighing arguments, analyzing arguments and evidence, that's for sure. In terms of the substantive knowledge I have about the law, it doesn't help that much with national security. It, it does more in that regard in domestic policy. You know, and things, when you get into complicated areas of law like bankruptcy or immigration, you know, having that grounding helps, helps quite a bit. But... Uh, I just thought, you know, that it would be a, a good good education to have that provide not only substantive knowledge that a lot of people in our society need and therefore pay for, but also it would be good training to sharpen my mind and critical thinking. So you graduate, you clerk, do some private practice, and then your life takes a big turn, right? You join so, the U.S. Yeah, Army. So that that is the correct timeline, but the impetus there goes back earlier. So I I had just started... My third year in law school when the 9-11 attacks happened. Um, Where were you? Do you remember? uh, I was in evidence class in Austin Hall. And that was back when woolly mammoths roamed the earth. And we didn't have smartphones or text messaging or Wi-Fi in the classroom. So we sat through, I think it was an 8 to 9.30 class, maybe 8.30 to 10. So we sat in the evidence class ignorant of what had happened. And I remember walking out of the class and seeing dozens of students kind of milling about, looking shell-shocked, many of them crying. You know, this... Harvard, you have lots and lots of people who come from New York who had spent a few years working in New York before they got to law school. And then, you know, so I went over, I'd heard what happened, went over the student comments and uh, watched for a few hours on TV before going back to, to my apartment to watch the rest. When did it hit you that you wanted to serve? It was really that day. You know, I talked to a good friend of mine. Uh, and we both talked about going out, you know, dropping out of school and going out to join right away. Discretion became the better part of valor. I talked to a few of my friends who were in the Army or who had served in the Army, and uh, consistent themes emerged from those conversations. One, the enemies are not going anywhere. Two, the Army is not going anywhere. And three, if you drop out of Harvard Law School with three years' worth of loans to become a private or lieutenant, your loans are going nowhere. <laughs> so, uh, And I had already, already accepted a job to clerk with that federal judge, Jerry Smith, who's on the Court of Appeals in Texas, and while it's easy to back out of a law firm job, you know, they hire dozens of people every year, to uh, go back on your word to a federal judge who hires two years in advance, only three or four people at a time, is a fairly dishonorable thing to do. So the combination of advice from my friends and also the commitment I'd given to Judge Smith compelled me to go ahead and finish school and complete my clerkship. Um, this is in the back of your mind the whole time. It was, yeah. And it, so and it, it worked out very well for me. I mean, there were times when, when I regretted waiting. You know, I was clerking for Judge Smith during the run-up to the invasion of Iraq and during the invasion. And uh, I was also studying for the bar at that time, uh, which I took in February 2003. I remember thinking that I would much rather be stationed in Kuwait right now than studying the <laughs> rule against perpetuities for the, for the Arkansas bar. But it worked out very well for me. I, I did go on to work at a law firm as well to, to pay off the remainder of my loans. So that meant that, you know, I, I got more life experience under my belt. I was in the workforce. Financially, I was, I was prepared. You know, I went into the Army without any debt. Once I started making about $400 a month as a private, I realized that that was a smart move. But uh, also, you know, I did time to get physically prepared to check, go from just being a, a weekend warrior on the basketball court to someone, you know, who was physically prepared for the rigors of being an infantryman, mm-hmm. going through infantry training and then being But you were, offered, you were offered the opportunity to serve in the JAG, yeah. right? The, yeah, yeah. The, and be a lawyer. That, right? was, and that you, never crossed my mind. And you said no. No, no. From the very beginning. I mean, like I said, I, I had a big shift in my mindset after the 9-11 attacks. I no longer was thinking about the career progression I would take as a lawyer, you know, what I might end up doing, you know, in private practice, what I might end up doing as a prosecuting attorney or anything. I, I was very much thinking about going to the front lines and leading men in combat in defense of our country. So and you did that, that in both Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, um, more so in Iraq than Afghanistan. You know, I was a platoon leader with the 101st Airborne in Iraq. So that, that was every day going out on patrol. Afghanistan, I was an operations officer for makeshift, you know, ad hoc unit called a provincial reconstruction team. So I, 
I was functionally the kind of the equivalent of a company commander because I had a lieutenant working for me and a uh, platoon that he commanded. So he was out every day. I'd go on a patrol a couple times a week with them. So I, I still had troop leading responsibilities, but I had a lot of more planning responsibilities for our commander as well. But that's really what I wanted to do. So when I, you know, I went into the recruiting station and talked to the recruiter there in Houston while I was in my clerkship because I wanted to get the ball rolling. I mean, I was dressed in a suit and tie, which doesn't happen <laughs> every day in recruiting stations all around America. He asked me what I did, and I told him I was a lawyer, and he pitched me on the JAG, which is a completely separate recruiting process like doctors and chaplains are. And he said, look, you know, if you're really motivated to get downrange, then this is the better course of action for you because it only takes about 14 weeks of training. You'll get to be a captain, which, by the way, pays more money, and you can go overseas right away. And I just told him I just wasn't interested in doing it. I wanted to be in the infantry. I wanted to be in ranger. I wanted to go over overseas and be a combat leader. And he just laughed and said, I must not be a very good lawyer. Uh, <laughs> but to his credit, he just signed me up. I mean, officer candidate school contracts are the hardest contracts for a recruiter to sign. So oftentimes recruiters will, if you're like me, if you're a professional, direct you into that professional path, which is a much easier contract to sign, or just encourage you to be an enlisted private from the very beginning. And to his credit, he worked hard to get my uh, OCS contract through. So two questions about that. One is, I think the United States military in general and the United States Army in particular are remarkable teachers of leadership and remarkable creators of yeah. leaders. So what did you learn about leadership, well, you know, so particularly, first, I, particularly you know, with men in combat? Yeah, so, so first, I agree. Uh, there's no better leadership training school than the United States military. Uh, I have a slight bias for the infantry, but uh, broadly speaking, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Army, no better training for leadership. And I'll tell all of your listeners what I tell individually or in small groups, you know, the high school students and the college students to whom I speak regularly, you should join the military. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do or what you think you're good at. You know, you can be, you know, a standout three-star stud in your high school, or you can be the most kind of bookish, uh, introverted person. The military knows how to take you and to teach you how to be an effective soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, and instill in you not just practical skills, not just firing a rifle or, you know, running a supply chain, but intangible skills like leadership and teamwork and mission focus and discipline that will put you far ahead of your peers. So, you know, especially when you talk to kids who are getting out of college, you have a chance to go work at a prestigious, you know, investment bank or company like Google or Apple or Facebook, and then go on to go to a fancy business school afterwards, maybe get startup money and start their own company. Those are all great things to do. But if you spend three years in your country's military, you can still do all those things. And I know at 22, those three years seem like a very long time, but the way that your peers will see you, that your fellow citizens will see you, that future employers and potential investors will see you, will be vastly different if you've spent that time serving your country in the military because they know what they're getting. In, this, in the same way that, you know, say Google or Facebook or Apple might recruit from Stanford or Caltech because they know that's certain a branding or credentialing function, employers across America know what they're getting when they're hiring a veteran. So no matter who you are, no matter what you want to do in life, I strongly encourage you to explore the United States military. And you know, the, the military for me was kind of an extension of a lot of the lessons I'd learned from my parents on the farm or from my coaches or in junior RTC about the one, the centrality of, of leadership. You know, the army, in army doctrine, leadership is the most dynamic element of combat power. What are the other ones? Maneuver, information, fires, and I forget the last one. But it's the most dynamic one. You, just, you saw that officer candidate school, you know, 150, 150 officer candidates. And the way they both teach leadership and evaluate leadership is to rotate leadership. So this week, you're in the role of private. Next week, you may be the company commander or the platoon leader or squad leader. And in a week where our company would have sound leaders, who knew how to organize and lead and motivate. We'd hit all of our time hacks. You'd have plenty of time to eat your meals. You'd get six hours of sleep a night. Next week, the exact same organization of people, the exact same people have bad leaders. Miss every time hack, have four hours of sleep a night if that, didn't have time to eat your food. You know, the instructors be on your case all the time. Just kind of a laboratory level experiment of the significance of leadership. You know, the, again, Army doctrines that you know, leadership is about purpose, motivation, and direction, um, providing, you know, purpose of why we're doing something, direction of how you're going to do it, motivation about why you want to do it. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, um, 
it's everything. It's both a necessary yeah, and, and a, sufficient condition for yeah, success. And, and especially in the, again, in the one reason why I was drawn to the Army and drawn specifically to the infantry and within the infantry, the light infantry, is that the core thing you do as a light infantry officer is lead men. So e- even if you're in mechanized infantry, if you're driving Bradley fighting vehicles, which still has well, you know, four squads sitting in the backs of them, but if you're a tanker or you're you know, a supply officer, you are still leading troops, but at the core of your mission is also the care and feeding of that system, whether the system is a Bradley fighting vehicle or an Abram tank or a computer so logistics system. When you're a light infantry officer, the only system, so to speak, you have you know, it's an M4 rifle and a two or three grenade launcher and a 249 squad automatic weapon, a 240 Bravo machine gun, and some Singars radios. That's it. And, and men. And men. And, but that's it in terms of hardware. Mm-hmm. Those things are extremely easy to operate. You know, a skilled instructor could teach someone with no background at all how to use them in four hours. So your core system, so to speak, is your privates and motivating and inspiring and giving them direction to accomplish a task. Things that seem very easy or that Hollywood might make look very easy that are very hard to do, you know, coordinating the movements of 40, 40 fighting men when the enemy is shooting back and they're carrying heavy loads and it's 120 degrees. And to, to give one example, or to give an example from another part of my life, being at Arlington National Cemetery and coordinating the movements of a full company of men and conducting a funeral. They're all connected. They're all intimately connected to, the, to the, those intangible skills I talked about that the military instills, and especially you know, being an infantry officer in steel and to carry you forward throughout your life. Yeah. So the second question, second question, Senator, is, so, so you were at the very tip of the spear of American power when you were in combat. How do you think about what America's role is in the world, what our role should be, and how much did service in the military help shape that? So it certainly shaped and refined it, but, you know, it was, it was present. I mean, I, I don't believe in American leadership in the world because I joined the army and served at the tip of the spear. I, I joined the army and served at the tip of the spear because I believe in American leadership and strength, confidence in the deployment of America's leadership around the world. So whether it's today, whether it's 2006 when I was in Iraq, whether the 19th century, you know, the, the fundamental strategic objective of the United States is to prevent an attack on the United States and our citizens. To do that, you know, we have to secure the Western Hemisphere. You know, we're part of the New World, not the Old World. That's one reason why the Monroe Doctrine is the most strategically elegant statement of, Amer- of America's grand national policy. The best way to secure the United States and to secure the Western Hemisphere is to do so forward, um, not to allow any single nation, any single power, or any single group of powers to combine the resources and the population and the territory of the old world, which could then be deployed against the new. That's fundamentally why we went to war in World War I and ultimately in World War II, and why it was in our national interest to do so. The way we defend forward is to be willing to fight a lot of small wars so we don't have to fight a big war again. That was one of the core lessons coming out of the interwar period in World War II. We'd rather not fight those small wars. We'd rather not have to fight wars like Korea and Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq but we have to be willing to do so. Also, we can avoid fighting a general war, which in an era of nuclear weapons would be globally catastrophic. And to defend forward and be willing to fight those small wars, hopefully to deter them from happening in the first place, that means we need allies. That means we need bases. And we have to be a good ally and cooperative with those countries that, that host us and provide us with the geopolitical location or the skill sets, or the material, or the troops that help us. So that can be you know, South Korea and Japan and East Asia, our Middle Eastern partners, Germany and Italy, and some Eastern European countries now in Europe as well. Circumstances change. You know, circumstances changed from 1945 when basically all of our main competitors globally had been pancaked, um, whether they were allies like France or whether they were adversaries like Germany and Japan. And, you know, the, our share of global GDP was some crazy high number, like 40, 50, 60 percent. That changed by the mid-1970s. You know, what might have been sound economic or trade policies, for instance, in 1945, you're trying to help those allies get back on their feet so they can be allies with us against an aggressive, you know, global expansionist ideology grafted on a traditional nation state like Russia was at the time, changes once they become more competitive in the 19, mid-1970s. Likewise, it changes once that 
that global aggressive ideology grafted onto a nation state, the Soviet Union ceased to exist in, in 1991. So again, just like with domestic policy, our particular policies may change, but our overarching strategy should not, and has not since the beginning of our country. And we should always come from a position of strength. The lion may lay down with the lamb one day, but I would rather be the lion when that happens. I'm sure you would agree it's not just about a strong military, but it's also about strong intelligence capability and a strong diplomatic capability. Of course, and strong economic capability as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons why we eclipsed the United Kingdom as the world superpower, which we've shared between ourselves for about 350 years now, is that ultimately the United Kingdom simply couldn't compete with the United States on economic scale. And therefore, when, you know, what had sustained the empire, the Royal Navy, they were not able to continue to sustain. So they gradually handed off that leadership role for us over a 30-year period from the end of World War I to the end of World War II. And you serve on both the Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committee. I think you're the only member of your party to do that. What have you learned about intelligence from being on the Intelligence Committee? So, so it's vital, I and mean, it's old. I mean, they call it the second oldest profession. With all the virtues of the first? <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not I. It's oftentimes misunderstood. You know, you write about this at the outset of your book, about three misunderstandings. I think one of them is the, uh, the mission impossible misunderstanding, that it can do anything under any circumstances. One is the uh, Jason Bourne misunderstanding that it's you know, a bunch of rogue actors who have no political oversight. Three is the Get Smart or uh, Maxwell Smart misunderstanding that it's a bunch of bumbling fools. It's none of those things. I mean, it's people like all of us. You know, it's moms and dads and young people starting out in their careers, everyone who's trying to defend our country and get policymakers the information they need to do so. And there's a lot of critical functions to do, to do that. You know, they have to collect foreign intelligence, which means stealing secrets in violation of other countries' laws. You know, if you don't have that core function, you know, if you don't have clandestine inf- information that you've acquired, you know, then the analysts, which is a second core function, are not doing much more than what they could do if they were working at a think tank or working at the Council on Foreign Relations. Exactly right. Um, but those analysts sit at a critical node where they are linking together what you might collect in seven different countries and collect through signals intelligence and collect through open source intelligence. Of course, a function governing both of those is counterintelligence to make sure that what you are collecting and the analysis you are providing is not being sent right back to your enemies. Uh, and then there's a you know fourth function of covert action. Many of those have been declassified. So you can discuss some like our Afghan covert action policies in the 1980s. Those are often seen as a bigger part of the intelligence world than they really are, as you know. Uh, they certainly are not a substitute for policy. They're a complement to policy. Presence of both parties for too, for too long, too, too often, you know, use it as a substitute because they can't craft a politically durable policy that gets the support of the American people in Congress. But uh, the men and women in our intelligence services do an extremely good job under very difficult circumstances. Do they get it wrong? Of course they do. And it's because bad guys out there are trying to force them to get it wrong. And there's a lot of really hard problems and challenges that they're trying to confront. But I have nothing but the highest respect for the men and women in our intelligence services who work in a very tough, very critical job. So, Senator, you've, um, you've been very generous with your time. I just want to ask you one more question, which is you and your wife, Anna, have two boys. I know you're very proud of them. Um, how much do they motivate you every day for what you do when you come to the United States Senate? Yeah, so, so we have... Uh, Gabriel, who's about two and a half, and Daniel, who just turned one. So we're still in the stage of life with our boys where we have, you know, temper tantrums, crying, afternoon naps, which, you know, is kind of like being a United States senator as well. (laughs) Um, But when I get done with all that and and I go back and and I see them, uh, they provide me a lot of motivation. You know, the desire we all have to watch our children grow and flourish fulfill their dreams, and to keep them safe, to protect them, whether it's protecting them from an illness or protecting them from criminals, protecting them from foreign attacks. And you think about families who've been the victims of terrorist attacks, whether it was on 9-11 itself or in the recent truck attack in, in New York, and you know my heart breaks for them. And it motivates me every single day to try to protect every American and every mom and dad and every son and daughter from that kind of threat and to make sure that they have the ability to flourish and prosper and pursue their dreams, whatever those dreams may be, whether it's making money or teaching kids or saving souls or fighting wars. But hopefully 
that they won't have too many wars to fight. But to do so, we have to take seriously the threats that our enemies pose and that war still is a real possibility. And when war is a possibility, losing a war is a possibility. And there's not many things worse in life than losing a war. Senator, thank you for your time. And we'll um, hopefully get you back at some point to talk about the big issues of the day that are facing this country from a national security perspective. Thank you. Good to be on with you. That was Senator Tom Cotton. I'm Michael Morell, and this was Intelligence Matters. Please join us next time. And now for something a bit different. We've established an email address for Intelligence Matters. It is intelligencematterspod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your comments. We'd love to hear who you would like to have us on the show. And for this first time, for the first 10 emails we receive, if you give us your name and address, we will send you an Intelligence Matters lanyard free of charge. Please send us a note.